Okay, hello. In this video, I'm going to talk about the introduction to antiderivatives. Okay, so first thing is that we're going to define what an antiderivative is. Uh, we'll get into the notation of or the notation for antiderivatives, talk about some of the basic integration rules, and then we'll get into what's called general solutions and particular solutions. Okay. All right, so let's get started here. So the idea with antiderivatives is this. Uh, so if we have, let this be a collection of functions. Okay? And we're gonna have this be another collection of functions. And let's say the way to go from here to here is through the differential operator. We're gonna call that D. Okay? So, we know that if we have, let's say, x squared, okay, and if we go ahead and take its derivative with respect to x, we're going to get 2x. Okay. Likewise, if we have x squared plus 1, okay, take its derivative, we're also going to get 2x. Okay. And let's say we have x squared minus 2, okay, we take the derivative and we're going to get 2x here, okay? All right, so, okay, and so we can, just by looking at this, we can say that uh, the derivative of x squared plus some constant, okay, so the derivative of x squared plus some constant will always give us 2x. Okay, so now here comes the with, here comes the idea of antiderivatives. Okay, so the idea is that okay, given something here, right? How do we right? The idea is that we want to get back into this set. Okay. So in other words, if we have, for example, two x, then we want to come up with something like this. Okay, all right, and so you may notice. Okay, you may notice here, um, again, that each of these, right, x squared has, right, we can have a, we add a constant, when we take its derivative, uh, we end up getting 2x, okay? So in order to, in order to do this, in order to incorporate all those constants, what we, what we do is we write, basically, we use a, uh, we use a C, C, so C for constant, okay? And that's what we have here. We have this form. Okay. So this turns out to be uh, what's called the antiderivative of 2x. Okay, and so this this constant captures all the possibilities. Of course, there's more right. There's there's more functions than this. There's inf actually, in fact, there's infinitely many functions, um, such that when you take the derivative, we'll give you back two x, right? Because there's infinitely many values for c. Okay, so this is again. So this is what we say is the antiderivative. So the antiderivative of two x is simply going to be x squared plus c. All right, so let's go ahead and define what, let's go ahead and state the uh, definition of an antiderivative. Okay, so let's say we have a caution, uh, uh, let's say we have a function f. So that's going to be. A function f is an antiderivative of, let's say that we have lower, let's say lowercase f, okay, and okay, so we have function f, capital F is an antiderivative of lowercase f, okay, if 
f prime of x equals to uh, this f of x. Okay, so again, what this is saying is that, go back to this example, so this, right, um, in this kind of picture diagram here, uh, the, F, the capital F, right, is basically these, okay? So these are, right, these, right, this is your antiderivative of 2x, okay? All right, so an, a function F is an antiderivative of F, such that when you take the derivative, okay? So if you take the derivative of that function, then you're gonna get back this part, okay? So like right here. So these are, this is the antiderivative of, of 2x, okay? Because when you take the derivative of this form, it gives you 2x, right? And so then to go, so the antiderivative of this, whatever's here is gonna be in, in this set. So well, that's how we define the antiderivative here. Okay. So a function f, and the reason why we use, okay, we're using capital F and lowercase f is because they're two different, right? They're just written, uh, expressed just differently in most cases. Okay. Like over here, we have x squared plus constants. Over here, there are two times x. All right, so a function f is an antiderivative of f if we take that if we take the derivative of this function and that equals to f, okay? This f here. Okay. Okay, here's a here's another example. Let's say we want to find the antiderivative of, let's say, of cosine x. Well, we know, right? We know that the derivative of sine x is cosine x, okay? So, right, so since, Okay. Again, so cosine x is in this set, and we want to find out how to get back over here. So the derivative of, since the derivative of sine of x with respect to x is cosine x, then the antiderivative of cosine x is, is going to be sine x plus some constant. So that is our antiderivative. Because when we take the derivative of this, okay, we get this form. Okay, so since the derivative of the constant is, is zero. So we want to make sure that we capture all the different possibilities, right? Okay. And so again, so right, going back to this idea, we have the function here, we take its derivative, we get back over here. That's what we call the antiderivative. Okay. Okay, and I'll just write here, derivative. <laughs> okay, so there's there's some rules. There's there's some rules associated with this that we're going to get into. Uh, that we're going to discuss them later on. Okay, uh, but first, uh, let's see. By the way, we call this we call this a family of antiderivatives.
family of antiderivatives uh, for, for cosine x. Right, because we have a collection. We have a collection of right of different of actually it's an infinite collection of functions here because c could be anything. All right. Okay, here's a, here's another example, and with this example, this kind of this the this example introduces the idea of uh, what's called a differential equation. Okay, so differential equations are basically equations that involve the um, that involve the differential operator. Okay, uh, such as the one you see here. So we have y prime equals to four. So the goal here is to figure out okay what is the what is the value for or what is the function for y such that when we take its derivative will give us four. And so this is really just a uh, an antiderivative uh, kind of problem, right? So, so we really we really just want to find the antiderivative of four here. So thinking, so okay, again, assuming four is right, or four is in here, and we want to figure out, okay, what is the corresponding function in this set? Okay. Well, we know that if we take the derivative of four x, that's going to give us the value four, and then we just add on c to that. So therefore, that's our solution. Our solution is going to be y equals to four x. Okay. Because the derivative of 4x is simply 4 plus some constant. So that's our that's our solution to this differential equation. Okay. All right. Okay. And I'll just put a note here. All right, so um, let's go into the notation uh, for antiderivatives because writing writing this out each time is um, it gets tiring after a while, right? So antiderivative of a function, right? It's there's a, a much more um, compact way to do this. Okay, and in mathematics we we always like symbols. Okay, so here's so let's so we're gonna uh, introduce some notation for this. So notation for antiderivatives. All right, so we have this symbol here, our function, okay, and then we have this differential, and then this is going. So basically, this, okay, um, this is what's called the integral. Okay, so we take the integral. So think of it as an operator. Okay, so we take the integral of f of x with respect to the variable, right? In this case, so we're saying take the integral with respect to x. So that's why the dx is there. Okay. 
There'll be some other um, later on. We're going to talk about, we're going to make the connection between the integral and the summation. So there is a, uh, there is some meaning behind this, um, especially in what's called definite integrals. Okay? But for the time being, just think of this as you're taking the, you're trying to figure out the integral, right? In other words, the antiderivative of the function with respect to X. Okay. And so that's going to give us back some function. Okay. So we just, we distinguish, we don't want to, right? This could be something different. Okay. So that's why we generally use a capital F here. Plus our constant. Okay. So Right, so this is your this is your integral sign. Okay. This right here is the what's called the integrand. So that is the that's the function that we're taking the integral of. Okay, that's the integrand. Uh, this is the differential. Okay, and uh, this is the this is the antiderivative. Uh, plus the C. And C is the integration constant. All right. So we have the integral sign, the integrand, our differential, and then the antiderivative, and then C is the integration constant. Okay. So that's a so basically so taking the antiderivative is the same thing as saying finding the integral of a function. Okay, so those are kind of and the same same idea. Okay, and then like I said later on, um, we're going to talk about um, the uh, what's called the definite integral, and so that's related to basically some ideas from geometry and, and this, through the use of summations. And so for those, there'll be some bounds here. It's called the lower bound and the upper bound, okay? Okay, so there's, some, uh, there's a couple important rules here uh, related to this idea of integral, okay? All right, so I wanna talk about those. Those some very basic integration rules. So if we take the integral of the derivative here, okay, so f prime of x, okay, with respect to x, then this is basically going to give us back um, the original function okay, plus some constant. Okay. So what this is doing is you're taking right. So you're so first you're taking the derivative. Okay. So you're taking your function is here. You're taking the derivative ends up here somewhere and then taking the integral and it puts you back to the function, whatever the original function that you took the derivative of plus some constant, okay? And so for example, let's say, let's see. Let's suppose that for this case, we want to let 
f of x be equal to x squared. Okay. So meaning that our function is in here. Okay. In fact, I'll do x cubed just to do something slightly different. Okay. So f of x is equal to x cubed. So if we take the derivative of this, okay, then that's going to give us 3x squared. And now we're going to take the integral, right? We have f prime of x. Now we want to take the integral of 3x squared. And because the derivative of that was 3x was uh, 3x squared, sorry, the, um, the yeah, so the derivative was 3x squared. So that means that when we take the integral of this, it's going to undo, basically it's gonna, uh, the integral will undo this derivative. So we're gonna be left with x cubed plus c, right? So maybe I can write like this, make it a little bit more clear, okay? So, so what we did is we had So we took the, right, you take the derivative of x cubed, right, and then it's integral, okay? And this is going to give us, so basically the integral of 3x squared right, and then that's going to, and then that's going to give us, basically that's undoing this, the integral is undoing this differential. But we get back x cubed plus c. Okay. So that's what that's what this try that's what this means. Okay. So but the, the bottom line is that this integral undoes this derivative. And so we get back. Okay. So you notice that this is x cubed, x cubed is here. Okay. And then we add on a c to that. Okay, we can also flip this around. In other words, we can take the derivative of the integral. So that's, okay, that's the first one, okay, second one. So just flipping around the order, okay? So now taking the derivative of this integral. So using uh, using the same example, or using the same functions that we had here. So we take the integral, right? So the integral of, let's see, I'm using, so f of x, I'm gonna use, using the same one. So let's say uh, 3x, so the integral of 3x squared. So taking the integral of 3x squared, that part is going to be x cubed because the derivative of x of x cubed is 3x squared. So we take this is going to be so the derivative of x cubed is going to give us 3x squared. So the point here is that again whatever we have here is going to be here. Okay? Because this think of this is just undoing so the derivative of the integral cancel those cancel out. Okay. And so those are the two basic uh, integration rules, okay? Of how the basically if the it's again it's just saying like just saying taking the integral of the derivative, and then here we're taking the derivative of the integral. Basically, it's just showing you showing us how those cancel out, okay? Um, no matter what the order is. And the only thing is with this one, when we take the integral, with, when we take the integral of the derivative here, uh, we're going to have the constant. 
But over here, that constant doesn't show up uh, because we're because we're doing the derivative on the outside. Okay? And so the derivative of a constant is zero. Okay. All right, so there's all right, so there's some more uh, there's there's some specific rules for finding uh, integrals. So I'm going to define some of those here. So the first one is that the integral of zero, okay, this is just going to be zero plus some constant, okay? If we have the integral of, let's say, uh, let's say constant, actually, I'll state that one later. Oh, yeah, I'm just going to do that now. So but if we have a constant in, the, in there, okay? Then we're allowed to pull that constant outside the integral, just like just like with the derivative, okay? Um, let's see the other. Okay. So if we have, if we have just the integral of a constant with respect to x. Then this is going to be equal to the constant times x plus c. The reason is because when we take the derivative of c times x, that's simply going to give us back the constant. And then the derivative of the constant is going to be zero. Okay. And then this next one is very important. It's basically the uh, the power rule for integration. So if we have x to the n, okay, then the integral of this, in other words, the antiderivative is going to be, we're going to add one to that exponent. And then whatever we get there, we're going to divide by that. That's going to, and we're going to add on a c. Now, the thing, if, if you notice here, um, if n was negative 1, then this is not going to exist, okay? So this is, so this is for n, right? So for n not equal to 1. And so then that leaves us the question of what is the integral of something like x to the minus 1? Okay, so let's see if I have some space here. So what if n was negative one? Oh, well, that is simply just the integral. That's equal to the integral of one over x. Okay. And so if you if you recall, okay, there is a there is a there is a specific derivative such that when you take or I'm sorry, a specific function such that when you take the derivative of it, gives one over x. And so, um, yeah, it turns out to be natural log x. We add a, a c there, okay? And this is where we need to put, in this case, we need to, whenever we end up with natural log x, we need to put an absolute value there. It's just to emphasize that we're working with real numbers, right? Okay? Um, because if you take a natural log of a negative number, it's going to be, it's going to give you an imaginary result. Okay. So, okay? so those are the, those are some of the, those are the, some of the basic rules. Now, also remember that you have the, the other formulas for like e to the x, the trig formulas. So those, so the derivatives of those are because we know the derivatives of those functions, then you have it. You also have those for your antiderivatives. So for example, uh, right, since the derivative of sine is cosine, 
Okay? Therefore, the antiderivative of cosine is sine. Okay? And it turns out that the integral of, of sine is negative cosine. Okay? So I'll write that here. Integral of sine of sine of x is minus cosine x. The reason it's negative is because when we take the derivative of cosine, the derivative of cosine is negative sine x. So to undo to undo the negative, we put the negative there, right? So we get negative negative that gives you back positive. Okay. So All right, so the derivative of cosine is negative sine of x, and therefore, okay, uh, therefore, uh, we take in order that's why we put a negative here, okay, to undo that. So you get negative times a negative, and that brings me back to positive sine x. All right, um, and so there's another example the Integral, right? The integral of secant squared x. The integral of secant squared x, what is that going to be? Well, you got to remember what is the, what function when you take the derivative of it gives secant squared x? Well, it's going to be tangent x plus some constant. Right? So that's why it's a very important. Um, to, to know your um, derivatives. If you know your derivative, if you know the rules, right, or if you know the derivatives of those functions, then you, then you automatically know the antiderivatives uh, for those corresponding functions, right? Okay. In fact, let me... What I'll do is I'll bring up that chart here. All right, so if you can see these, so you can, all right, so there's the, there's the um, power rule for integrals. There's the, so these are the ones for the, uh, for the trig functions. Okay. E to the U, because I do it E to the U, E to the U is just E to the U, therefore the integral E to the U is just E to the U plus C. There's the one for A to the U, uh, there's integral one over u, okay? and then you have these others, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Okay? okay, so let's go over, I want to go over a few more examples of, of some of these. So remember, this, this part tells you basically what you're integrating with respect to. And just to be slightly different here. 
So the differential tells you what you're integrating that function with respect to, right? With respect to whatever, whichever variable. Okay, so the first one we have the integral of five dx. So that is going to be 5x plus c. Again, because when we take the derivative of 5x, we get 5 here for the anti, for the, um, sorry, for the um, integrand. Okay. Uh, the integral of minus 1 dr, okay, that is simply going to be minus r dr, sorry, minus r plus c. Because the derivative of negative r with respect to r is negative 1. And then, of course, don't forget the, Constant, okay. The integral of 2 dt, okay, so that's simply going to be 2, okay, 2t plus c. Again, because the derivative of 2 times t is simply 2, okay, and then c is going to be, um, when you take the derivative of c, it's 0, okay. Right. Okay, so I want to go over some examples of using that, uh, using this power rule, okay? uh, number four there. So just like with derivatives, um, sometimes you have to rewrite the function and then um, and then apply the rule. Okay. So all right. So for this, we don't need to rewrite it. Um, just keep in mind that this is so we can re we can um, or we can say that this is the same as as this. Okay. We can take out the five. Okay. And then. Since there's a one here, okay, we apply this rule. So we add one, and whatever we get there, we di we divide by that. Okay, so this is going to be equal to five times x to the power two divided by two, and add our constant. Okay, so we can rewrite this as five halves times x squared plus c. And the, the thing is, you can always most cases, you can always check your work here, okay? Take the derivative of this, so the two comes down, five halves times two is five, and then we're left with x there. So we, okay, and so that gives us back our integrand, okay? All right. Next one, we have one over x squared. So we need to rewrite it in this form, okay? So, so one over x squared algebraically, that's going to be x to the minus 2. Okay. And again, so we apply the power rule. So we're going to end up getting x minus 2 plus 1. Whatever we, whatever we get there, we put here. And then we simplify this. So this is going to be x to the negative 1 divided by negative 1 plus c. And we can rewrite this as minus 1 over x plus c. Okay. Okay, the third one. Okay, we need to okay, also rewrite this. This is going to be equivalent to the integral of x to the one third dx. So that can be expressed in terms of our fractional power. And then now we apply our power rule. We're going to get x to the one third plus one 
divide by one third plus one, and then add on a C. We simplify this, this is going to give us x to the four thirds divided by four over three. Okay. And we really should simplify this further. Okay. So get try to get in the habit of doing that. You, you don't want to leave this here. So we have basically you have one over four thirds, and so that's going to be equal to three fourths. So three fourths times x to the four four thirds plus c. And there's our solution. So if, so if you get a fraction on the bottom like this, try to remember to take the reciprocal, and because it's it, it makes it it basically it just simplifies your result. And most, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, most of the faculty want, want it uh, simplified like in this form, okay? All right. And it's also easier to read. Okay, so. So in all these, for both of these examples, um, these are just taking the integral of single terms, right? Just simple, really, very simple functions, okay? So the question is, can we take the integral of something like a polynomial where you have not just one term, but maybe three, four, or five terms? And the answer is, of course, is yes, okay? So let's uh, look at, let's take a close look at those, at something like that. All right, so, um, so we already have this rule here, okay? Um, and so with if we have, uh, let's see, there's a, so there's another rule, just to state one here. So if we have the integral of something like this with more than it has, it has this obviously has more than just one function. So just like with derivatives, we can we can distribute this integral. Okay, so we we can distribute over addition or subtraction. Okay, and we also have this other rule. Or we can take out the constants. Okay. So that was stated here. So again, if both, right, if both of these, right, are, so if both of these are true, then we say that the integral is a linear operator. Okay. Which is not surprising because the derivative is a linear operator. So usually, you know, if we have if we have a certain if we have an operation that's going from that does that takes something from here to here, if that's linear, then typically going from here to here to whatever operation is also going to be linear. So it turns out yes, the integral is a linear operator. Uh, which is a really nice, uh, which is a really nice thing to have. And of course, this this can be generalized, right? We can take and have more than two functions. Okay? So sometimes these are kind of condensed into one one line. So if we have, for example, c one f one of x. So let's say we have basically what's called linear, or we have a, yeah, a linear combination of functions here. Okay. 
or just a, a combination of terms. Okay. Um, and let's say we have n of these. Okay. Then because of the fact that the integral is a linear operator, uh, we can separate these into, into a co uh, collection of n integrals. So again, we can separate things. This is just an extension on this idea. And then for each one of these, we can take out the constant. So this kind of idea um, with the uh, with the idea of uh, with the linear operator shows up in a lot of different a lot of different ways. Um, it shows up in um, linear algebra, um, linear algebra, right? Because it's um, of course linear operators. So we look at linear. So we basically it's one of the things that we look at in linear algebra. Uh, it's also this also this idea also shows up in um, differential equations. All right, but the point here is, the main point is that, yeah, we can take out constants from the integral, um, and we can also uh, separate the, we can also distribute the integral over addition or subtraction, okay? So something important to note here, okay? So we cannot distribute the integral over, over division or multiplication. Okay. Use a different color here, it's not showing up very well. So if we have something like this, where you have a product of two functions, uh, this, right, this is not the same as this. So you can't, we can't, we can't distribute the integral uh, in the in the sense that we can, right, in, the, in this kind of idea, in this kind of sense, right? So we can only distribute um, over. A, a, over addition or, or subtraction. Same thing with um, division. Okay. We can't you can't take the integral of f divided by the integral of g. Okay, um, it's it's not going. It it doesn't work that way. Just like again, just the same with um, right. We can't do this same. We can't do this kind of idea with derivatives either, right? Okay. So in fact, there's a just like for derivatives, right? And if you have a product of two functions, then we have what's called the product rule for derivatives. Well, there's also uh, there's also what's called a product rule for integrals. Um, and sometimes it goes by the name of integration by parts, okay? which is actually something you learn in, in the calculus two course. So, and, and that integration by parts formula can be derived directly from the product rule for, for derivatives. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty inter interesting to see the connection. And it's not really, it shouldn't be that shocking really, uh, because there is a connection between integrals and derivatives. All right. So just remember this, okay? Um, that you can't um, um, can't do this one and this one here. Uh, 
Um, there's other techniques that we're going to get to later on in case we do have something like this. Okay. Um, all right. So just kind of wait for that. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's go over a couple examples here. Let's say we want to take the integral of the 4x cubed minus 5x plus 2. Okay, so because of this, we can split this up, right? We have the integral of 4x cubed dx plus the integral of minus 5x dx plus the integral of 2x dx. So we can uh, split this up, and now this becomes three problems at one, okay? And because of this rule, we can take out the constants. Okay. All right. So first one, right? We apply the product. Uh, sorry, apply the power rule. So this is going to be four times get x to the fourth over four. Plus, let's see. Right? We have a constant for that. So let's call it c one. The next one we have minus five times uh, x. So x to the first power here. So this is going to be x to the power two over two. Plus, let's call that c two. And then plus the integral of dx. So the integral of dx is simply going to be 1. Okay. And by the way, I should have used, looking here, I should have used a different constant here. It's normally not the same. So let's call it c1. Okay. okay. So if you have the, so the integral of just dx, that's simply going to be this with where c is 1. So the integral of, so just think of this. Think of this as a there's a there's a hidden one here. So the integral of one is basically just x because the derivative of x is one. So this is going to be two x plus let's say c three. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and simplify the result here. So we're going to get x to the fourth since these fours cancel out, and then we have minus five halves x squared. Got this plus c1 minus five halves x squared plus c2 plus 2x plus c3. Okay, um, so now if we right, so we have c1, c2, and c3 again, those are coming from um, the constants for each one of these integrals, so we can actually write this way. what we can do is we can we can gather those constants up. So this is going to be C1 plus C2 plus C3, okay? And so because these are just arbitrary constants, what we can do is we can put them into one, like one big constant. So we can merge them together. So this is just going to become plus C, okay? So that's basically what's called an absorption of constants. Okay. So when you're when we're doing these kind of problems, for now we don't really need to worry about this. We can just do you know we can just do the integral, and then get the we get the antiderivative, and then throw in right get the integral of the function, and then just throw in just add on the c at the end. So you don't necessarily have to show this. This doesn't really become significant until like differential equations where you need to, we need to keep track of those, of those causes. So we don't need to do that here. Okay. So just do the integral and then just throw on, uh, just, just add the constant at the end. 
Okay. All right, let's look at another one. And I'm gonna go ahead and erase this. Yeah, let's look at another example here. Let's say we have the integral of x plus 2 all divided by square of x. Okay. So like I said, Sometimes you have to rewrite the function using algebra in order to use whichever, you know, whatever the rule is, okay, whatever the rule that we're trying that we're trying to apply here. Okay, so okay. We know that you have something like this, right? There's a rule that says that you can divide each of these terms by square root of x. Well, we're gonna get x over square root of x plus two over square x. Okay. So that's just, that's not even calculus, that's just algebra, okay? Right, okay, so now what we can do is we can simplify. Okay. So x to the power of one, okay, over square root x, okay? That is simply just x to the power of one times x to the negative one half. Sorry, x to the negative one half. So that is equal to x to the one half power. Okay. And then for the other one, this one is just simply two times x to the negative one half. So we have the integral of x to the one half, and we can go ahead and split this up. We have integral x to the one half dx plus the integral of two times x to the negative one half dx. Okay. Okay. So here's so now we have this form, right? Okay. And we just go ahead and use the power rule here. So this is going to be x to the one half plus one divided by one half plus one. Over here we have two x to the negative one half plus one divided by negative one half plus one. Okay. And then, like I said, we'll add on the C at the end. Okay, And so we simplify this. This is going to give us X to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves. Plus, this is going to be 2 times X to the 1 half over the 1 half power. That's, and then we don't want to leave it like this. Go ahead and take the reciprocal of these. So this is going to be 2 thirds. I should say take the reciprocal of the denominators. We have two thirds times x to the three halves plus here we're going to get two times two over one. So that's going to give us four or x to the power one half. And then we can go ahead and add on the c. So there it is. There is our, right, there's our result. So that is the integral of this. Okay? Now this one's a little bit hard to check. If you, if you want to take the, if you want to check your results, you know, you take the derivative of this you're not going to get this directly, so you have to go through, you have to take the derivative and go through some of the algebra to get back to, to this form. Okay. All right. But that is that is the process. Okay. So we are able to rewrite the integral, sorry, rewrite the function algebraically, and then we can go ahead and apply the power rule. Okay. And then we add on our constant, our integration constant. Okay. Uh, let's look at another example. Um, this next example is going to involve a trig function. Actually, a, a couple of trig functions. So let's say that we want to integrate. Say we have the integral of sine x 
over cosine squared x. Okay, so again, we need to uh, we need to rewrite this, okay, in order to to uh, to find the antiderivative here. So we know that we can um, we have cosine squared on the bottom, okay. So we can separate this, uh, we, or we can write it this way. We can have sine x over cosine x, and then for the other part, we can write like this. Okay. So we have sine x over cosine x times one over cosine x. That's so this is the same thing as this. Okay. And remember, you can't, right? We can't take the integral of this times the integral of this one. Okay. All right. So the only thing here to do is to recognize that, okay, we have sine over cosine. We recognize that that is tangent x. And what is right? One over. Uh, one over cosine x, that is secant x. Okay. So the integral, right? So then you recognize that the that the antiderivative of of tangent secant, or you can say secant tangent, is secant x. Okay. So again, this is basically illustrates why why it's important to to know your derivatives okay because what if you know your derivatives then you you're kind of able to figure out kind of it helps you helps you with the to you kind of guide you know to help you guide through the problem right so so by writing it this way and we end up with we know that this is tangent x and secant x then that brings us with this and you kind of automatically say oh yeah um, I remember there's a function such that when you take its derivative, it gives us tangent secant, and that is secant x. So that's again, that's that's why it's important to recognize those derivatives, so you can do these problems quickly. Okay. All right. So uh, yeah. So and, and also another thing is that with with these kind of problems, with integration problems. Um, you have to know your, you have to, you're going to be using your uh, trig identities to simplify things. So for example, let's say we want to take the integral of sine squared x plus cosine squared x. Technically we could do this in a different way, but right now we don't have many, there, we only have these rules, okay? So the way you would do this is you would recognize, you would remember that this would be one, right? So that's, a, so that's equal to one, okay? So this would just be simply be the integral of dx. And so the integral of one dx is just x, okay? So you're gonna get x here plus c. All right. Okay. Um, so let's get into uh, what's called general and particular solutions here. So in order to understand this, let's look at it. Let's look at a specific example here. So let's say we have dy dx equal to, let's say, 3x squared minus 1. Okay. 
And again, this is what's called a differential equation, right? So the goal is to figure out what is y, right? Such that when you take the derivative of it with respect to x, we get back over here. Okay. So the first thing you're gonna, so the first thing to do when you see something like this is to do what's called, um, we're gonna apply what's called method of separation of variables. Okay. So this can be written as dy equals to 3x squared minus 1 times, and all that's multiplied by dx. Okay. And so now, because the goal is to figure out y, so, we, so in order to get y here, we take the integral. Right. So this is the integral of 1 dy is just y. So if we take the integral of this side, then we must take the integral of the other side. Okay. And so now this is going to this is going to give us back y, okay? And then we just apply the rule here. So the integral of three x squared that's going to be three x to the power three over three, and then the integral of one is just x, and then we have a constant here. Okay. So simplifying this, this is going to give us y equals to x cubed minus x plus c. Right. So there's our there's our solution, okay, for this for this problem. So this this is what's called the general solution. Um, this is a term that's used in conjunction with differential equations, okay. So, right. So this is a differential equation of basically first order. First order differential equation, okay? And so in this part down here, this is what's called the general solution. So this is giving us a basically a family of curves, okay? And each, right? So there's infinitely many solutions here because C could be anything. It could be a real number. It could be a, a, a irrational number. Um, it could be anything, okay? So let me show you graphically what this looks like. So here's what it looks like, okay? So what I did here is plot the um, the general solution with various constant values. So the first one is, first one that you see here um, in the black color is when C is zero. And then the next one to put it in green, so that's for when C is one. And then this is when C is two here, okay? And then C is three, plot for now. So C is two. And then C is three. And then we put some, uh, put in some of the functions for negative values. So minus one, minus two, and then minus three. So these are just a few of them. These are all, of course, there's, I mean, it's impossible to plot all of them because they have infinite solution set here. But this gives you an idea of, um, uh, of what these look like okay, for this particular problem. And if you notice, the C, right, the C is basically, if you remember from pre calculus, the C basically affects the, vertical shift. So if C is positive, it's it's shifting up the curve by C number of units. Okay. If C is negative, it's going to shift down the curve by C number of units. So the shape is, so, so this is what we call a rigid transformation, meaning that the shape is preserved, not distorted. Okay. okay. So, um, so the next thing to talk about is the particular solution. So in other words, let's if we want to figure out, let's say we're given, we're given what's called initial value, okay, um, and we want to figure out, okay, what is this? What is the, what is the solution that goes through that 
specific coordinate value. That's what that's what we're going to look at now. We have our we have our general solution here. Okay, so the question now is okay. Let's say we're given. Okay, we're given the coordinate one, two. Okay, and we want to figure out, okay, what which curve, right? Which curve goes to that coordinate? Okay. Well, it's pretty uh, it's pretty simple to solve this actually. It's not too bad if you think about it because uh, remember that um, there's a coordinate. So we have X is one and Y is two. Here's our general solution. So we just simply need to plug in X, plug in this specific value for X, plug in the specific value for Y, and then we can solve for C. So, and that will give us our solution, okay? So we have, okay, so, you have x equals to one and y is equal to two. So simply c is going to be equal to two. Okay. So again, we just plug in x and y into here, and that leaves us with an equation to solve for c. So therefore, okay, y is going to be equal to x cubed minus x plus two. And so this is what's called the, this is what we call the particular solution. So that is the, that is the specific solution that's going through this coordinate. And so and sometimes we call this the initial value. A lot of times you'll see this, uh, this kind of value used in like population models where you're given some kind of initial um, some kind of initial uh, amount right uh, at, at some at time zero okay all right but that is yeah so that is again so this is the general solution and this is the particular solution and if we go back here okay back to show you the graph here So one comma two, so, so that goes through, right? So that's this, that's the curve that you see here. That's the one in purple that goes through that coordinate. Okay. Move all these. And that's the curve. That is the, our particular that is our particular solution. Okay, so with that in mind, what we can do is we can actually derive that position function. Okay, we can derive the position function where with the position. So remember the position function basically um, is used to model if you're, if you're throwing something up or if you're dropping something, then it can model the, the basically the distance between whatever the object is and the ground. Okay, all right. Uh, so let's do that. Okay, so we're going to derive the position function. Okay. And all right, so let's suppose.
And let's give it a specific context here. So we want to derive the position, the position, position function. Um, Okay. If a ball is thrown upward, okay. with some initial velocity, let's call that, let's say we're given just in general V of naught. Okay. from an initial height. Okay, and let's call it H and up. And we're going to neglect air resistance here. We're neglecting air resistance because that's throws in another, another variable. Um, and then we're going to assume that we're on Earth here. So acceleration okay. so the acceleration due to gravity is minus 30 feet per second squared Okay, so um, so because if you remember the if we so if you take the derivative of the position function, okay, so the derivative of the position function gives you the velocity function. The derivative of the velocity function gives us the acceleration function. Okay, so we are given so basically we're given the acceleration. What we want to do is we want to go back. We want to so we want to use this and go back. Take this, figure out the velocity function. And then from there, figure out the position function. And to do that, we're going to do that through the use of the integral. Okay. All right. So let's start with what we know. Okay. So we know this. Okay. okay. So we're going to go ahead and um, I'm, going to, I'm going to denote this to be S prime of T, or T is time. So we have minus 32. Okay. So our goal is to figure out. S of t, which will be our position function. Okay. So, all right, this is right, so this is our acceleration that's related to that is basically the second order derivative of our position function, which is what we're trying to derive. All right, so we're going to take the integral of this. That's going to give us our velocity function. Okay. And we take the integral of both of these with respect to t. Okay. So this is going to give us, oh, that should be double prime. So this is going to give us S prime of T, okay? Because you're undoing the derivative here, you're undoing the order, right? So that's going to bring us back to S prime. And then taking the integral of this one, this is going to be what? Minus 32 T plus some constant. Let's call that, uh, call it C1, okay? So now we got to figure out what is C1, okay? So we do that, uh, we can do that because we definitely know the initial velocity here. So we're assuming that it's just V of naught. Okay, so this is our velocity function, okay? That's our velocity, okay? So if we want to find, to find C1, okay, we're going to use V naught, okay? So remember the initial velocity, that is the velocity, that's the velocity at time zero, okay? So. Okay. 
Okay, so plot letting t be so letting t be zero, okay, we're gonna end up with this. So we have s prime of zero, okay. We know that the initial that's v naught, right? So when you plug in zero, that's into the into the derivative here, that's gonna be initial velocity, and that is okay, and that is going to be equal to minus 32. So minus 32 times zero. So we can easily see that um, this this is just zero. So C1 must be V naught. Okay. So we have this so far. Right? So we have S prime of T equal to minus 32 plus V naught. Okay. Okay. So now we need to, Remember, we're trying to figure out the position function, so we need to take the integral of, of both sides here. With respect to t. So the integral of this is gonna undo, okay, going to undo the derivative, that first order. So that's going to give us S of T. And then over here, we're going to get minus 32 T squared over two plus the integral of V naught is going to be V naught times T, okay? V naught is the constant, right? So we're left with the integral of DT, which is just T plus another constant. Let's call that not C1, but let's call it C2. Okay, so in order to, or the next thing to, to solve for is C2 here. And so we're, this is basically our, that is our general solution for, uh, for the position function. So the next thing is to solve for C2 and on this information. So we know, so we're given some, so we know we have, the object is being dropped at a certain height at time zero. Get all that. Okay, so that's our initial height at right. Okay, so H of I. Okay, so okay, we have S of zero. That's when you plug in zero into the position function, that's going to be H of naught. Okay. So we're going to get, um, by the way, I can simplify this a little bit more here. Okay. So we have minus 16 okay, times zero plus E of naught times zero plus C2. Right. So of course those terms with zero, those terms are gonna go, those terms are gonna uh, go away. And so we're left with C2 equals to H naught. So this term is zero, this term is zero. So we're left with uh, the fact that H2 must be H of zero, okay? So H sub zero. Okay, so, okay, so we plug in, um, so we now have C of two, so we can plug into here. We have S of T equals to minus 16 T squared 
plus V naught times T plus H sub zero. Okay. And that is um, that is our basically our, our solution. Okay. Okay. All right. That is our basically what we want. Right. That's our initial. Uh, sorry, our position function that we want to solve. Okay. Um, there is another way to do this um, through the use of Newton's formulas, um, but you know, it comes out, you know, it works out the same, okay? same idea. Um, you have to basically have to use the integral to, to solve for the, to get to the final result. Okay, so there it is. So that is, um, that is a good, a good example specifically of an application that, um, that uses uh, this idea of general solution, a particular solution. Because if we, right here, Right, we end up with our general solution, and then in order to find our particular solution, uh, we use our assumption here. Same thing over here. We have our general solution here, and then in order to find the particular solution, we use the initial height. Okay? And then that will, and therefore this gives us our our um, our particular solution for um, for our position function. Okay, there it is. All right, so I think we, we covered all the basic ideas of antiderivatives, right? So we defined an antiderivative. We talked about the notation, which is that funny looking S. Um, there is actually a connection. So there, I'll, so there is a connection between why they use this integral, um, why you use this symbol here. Well, we're gonna, so we're gonna get into what's called the definite integral. and. And so those are used for, or you can use this idea to calculate the, the, the total area underneath the curve. And so that involves a summation, okay? And so the idea, so the summation being the sum, then if you stretch out the S, then basically that's what you get, okay? So a little bit of history there, okay? Um, and then we talked about some of the um, basic integration rules that you see here. Um, and then we just, um, and then we talked about the general and particular solutions. So there are, there are some other, so these are the very, these are the basic rules, okay, some formulas. There are other rules that we'll get to later on. Um, and those are like more, those are more of techniques. I would say those are techniques more than just rules, okay? And so the integral is a very, it's not as simple as, uh, is finding the derivative because it's really it depends on what the function looks like um it depends on even if you have a function in rational form there's this one technique that may not may work and it may not work okay you may have to simplify you may have to rewrite the function in a certain way to do the integral um so in general the integral is a lot more it's a lot more involved uh, it's a lot more difficult than taking the derivative that's why in general, that's why calculus two is a is is more difficult than calculus one. Um, just a, you know, we have the, those techniques, right? And those techniques are very specific to depending on the type of function that we have, and then throwing that with the um, with the geometry part. So it makes calculus two. It's an interesting course, but it makes it very. Um, it it is more difficult than calculus one. But anyway, I'll stop here, um, and then. Um, we will continue next time.